Well, here we are. We're doing liver two, the second lesson in our series on the liver. Liver one was about anatomy, its location, and animals without gallbladders. And this is going to be, get my pointer get going, come on, functions of the liver. Okay, and then liver three that comes after this is going to be talking about the functional unit of the liver called the liver lobule. Okay, so now we're on functions. Well, I found this neat diagram, and I want to make a point about it. It says, what is the function of the liver? And they're going to say it has 500 vital functions. And I've seen that quoted before. What they're talking about is if you count up every little enzyme step, uh, you might get up to 500. Maybe somebody did that if they couldn't go to sleep one night. I want to concentrate on the main ones. And this figure has some main functions. And then I've got two more slides that I thought were very good. And these all pertain to our dogs, cats, horses, and most of the mammals. Okay, the liver has a function in immunity. Uh, the liver actually filters blood. And there's macrophages in there that will eat bad things. Synthesis, that means you're going to make proteins and cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a protein, but uh, we always hear about cholesterol. Some medical people think your liver is more responsible for your cholesterol blood levels in dogs and cats and horses and humans than what our diet is. It's controversial. The liver is also involved with uh, getting rid of wastes in the bile, not oftentimes called bile juice, but this person did. Up here in the upper right, blood clotting. Liver has a lot of, produces I should say, blood clotting factors, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so if the liver's not working right, blood probably can't clot right because clotting is a cascade. One step leads to another, then another, another in a series. And if any one step is not there, it stops. You don't get blood clotting. Drugs are excreted in some cases by the liver. Uh, alcohol is degraded. There's a lot of enzymes in the liver. And then if you have excess glucose, it's stored in the form of glycogen. So glycogen here is the storage form of glucose. And then we've got excretion of bile juice for lipid digestion. Yes, because bile emulsifies fat. Okay, now I'm going to show you two more figures that talk about the functions of the liver. And I picked out diagrams or figures that talk in a broad sense, not specific enzyme steps. And then, of course, after I'm done, you can pause it and study, add to your notes, whatever. Here's a nice little one. Of course, the liver, get this large here for you, the liver has a lot of metabolic functions, okay? Glucose homeostasis, okay? Glycogen lysis, lysis is a suffix that always means the breakdown, and so glycogen lysis breaks down glycogen and you would yield glucose in the blood. Remember, we're always looking at terms and uh, testing on terms. Gluconeogenesis, excellent term. Genesis, making, neo, new. Gluco here refers to glucose. The liver can take, like, for example, amino acids, certain ones, and make glucose. So gluconeogenesis is making new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, whatever. That's amazing. Synthetic, it makes a lot of albumin. We talked about that in blood, uh, in the blood section. Blood coagulation factors, yes. Complement, uh, we'll talk about that when we're in immunology. Complement is a serum protein that helps in immunity. All kinds of storage, well, I should, this is binding proteins. So in the blood, there's binding proteins for these molecules named. Okay, storage of glycogen, triglycerides, iron, copper, lipid-soluble soluble vitamins. Lipid-soluble are easy to remember. 
Just think of the word ADEC, A-D-E-K. That's the lipid solubles. Okay, then we break down catabolic, break down hormones, break down serum proteins. So if the liver isn't working right and breaking some of these things down, they'll have a longer half-life. Some hormones or maybe even some medicines taken by our animals will reach higher blood levels than normal because the liver isn't functioning right. And then we're going to talk about the breakdown of old red blood cells, and we get heme, and we're going to talk a little bit about that here shortly. So let me just narrow that down a little bit, get it up here, and then bring my other table or figure. I keep vacillating between figures and tables. And this is another one produced, another figure drawn by somebody. I believe this bile production probably refers to humans. You know, a liter a day, that's amazing. We're going to talk about Billy Rubin shortly, but Billy Rubin is really the breakdown, one of the breakdown products of hemoglobin. You should know from the blood section that red blood cells are always dying. They have a life of about 100 days, some would say 90 days, some would say 120, you know, something about 100. And um, got to get rid of that excess Billy Rubin. So, a lot of neat things there. Neutralizes and dilutes stomach acid. That helps because when the stomach contents come out of the stomach and get into the first part of the small intestine, you can't have that low pH in the small intestine. Here's that word, bile salts, emulsify fats. Emulsify means taking a big particle and making it smaller and actually that increases your surface area that other enzymes that enzymes can work on. Okay, secretin, if you can go back to our gut hormone section, you can look at this, but secretin stimulates bile secretions, affects the content of bile. We're all talking about here functions of the liver, storage, storage of glycogen, storage of fat, not too much hopefully. The vitamins, they included A D EK, right, a DEC, but then they also do B12, which is not a um, fat soluble vitamin, it's water soluble. Then you got copper and iron storage. And uh, of course, we talked about the hepatic portal blood comes to the liver from the small intestine. Okay, and then there's synthesis, blood proteins, uh, all kinds of things, albumins, globulins, heparin, that's a anticoagulant and then here's blood clotting factors very good little side by side that summarizes some of the main functions of the liver remember that's not 500 but it's some of the most famous ones now i just want to make a few comments about liver enzymes but this is a deep subject uh, you need to be trained in the interpretation of results that show liver enzymes but i just have a couple one from a dog, one from a cat, a panel that shows how uh, blood levels of liver enzymes can be checked. And then there's a way to uh, designate the results. So let me get over here and enlarge this a little bit. Okay, so this is a blood panel. I'll point out a few things. I'm only using this as illustration. I'm not doing any medical advice here. For example, cholesterol. This is from a dog. Um, I just happen to know it's not labeled, but it's from a dog. Okay, the cholesterol is 471. I'm not going to talk about units. And this little H means, hey, that's out of the normal range. Here's the normal range for a dog, 112 to 328. So when you get these blood panels back, if something's high, there's an H by it. It immediately attracts your eyes, your attention, I guess. And then if something's low, they put an L by it. So here, you know, 105 is the lower end, 103, everybody would probably say, well, we're not going to worry about that. And look at this, the uh, lower range is 0.75, but it called 0.7 low, which is right. But I mean, you got to be careful about that. Okay, anyway, here's a couple liver enzymes. And I mean, look at this case where... 1173 and the high of the range is 150 so wow maybe they should have put a couple h's there and then also for this liver enzyme 969 and the upper range is supposed to be 60. so pretty amazing what you can uh, get there now let me get another one this is from a cat 
so I'll enlarge it a little bit. And again, medical professionals need to interpret these. But just to show you again that, you know, if something's high, it's got an H by it. If it's something's low, it's got an L by it. And if it's in the normal range, then there is no designation in that column. And here's our bilirubin. We're going to talk about that shortly. But anyway, when the liver might be undergoing damage, for example, some of the enzymes leak out of the hepatocytes. Notice how I use that term, hepatocytes, uh, and are found in higher levels in the blood than they normally would be. So I think that's the take-home lesson here. Okay, well, we're moving right along here in our liver 2 lesson. And of course, we all tr always try to get a little pathophysiology in here when it's appropriate or when it's kind of easily understood. And so now I want to talk about jaundice. Uh, you might have heard of the term jaundice. You all should also, my tongue is getting tied here, also know it's called icterus. And I've got three nice visuals of when there's too much bilirubin in the animal and it shows up uh, clinically when you look at an animal. Okay, so let me see what I got here first. Okay, this is a cat. I'm going to enlarge it might get a little blurry, but I think you can talk yourself into, boy, that's a lot of yellow. That's abnormal. It's not because of cavities. It's because there's too much bilirubin in the blood, and it's going to be called hyperbilirubinemia. And in a little bit, I'll show you how that's spelled. But that's a cat with icterus. Okay, now let's get, uh, here's one. Yeah, I'll enlarge it large here. And this is a newborn foal. And the reason I've uh, included it is because of two things. First of all, newborn animals can have jaundice. Now, that's really weird, but I mean, it's not so weird, but maybe hard to think about. And so the, the kicker here is the whites of the eye have a yellow tint. And I didn't spell out sclera, so let me do that. S-C-L-E-R-A. Sclera is the term for the whites of the eye, the, you know, the whites of the eyeball. And so sclera normally is white. Let's see if I can get that over there. I'll put it over there. Okay. But in this case, and I'll even enlarge it more so we get a good picture there, that foal, a newborn foal, has jaundice and it's got yellow sclera. And I'll just get these out of the way. And then we bring in, we are always interested in humans. So here's a person with very yellow sclera. And uh, that's a very good picture of sclera. Unfortunately, it's a good picture. Let's put it that way. Okay, now I said just previously that that jaundice, icterus, one cause is hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, remember, I'm just using this as illustrations, not giving any medical advice, but I thought this figure was really neat because it tells you that you can have, an animal can have, hyperbilirubinemia even if the liver is working normally. So that's how complicated this all is. You need to find a good veterinarian or physician, depending on what animal you're talking about, of course, that, that's really good at what's called differential diagnosis, because some symptom can lead back many different places. It's amazing how complicated it is. So let me just show you this a little bit. I'll enlarge it. First of all, hyperbilirubinemia. Let me digest that word for you. Emia is a suffix that means blood. Hyper means high or above. There's that bilirubin. It's a breakdown product from red blood cells. So hyperbilirubin, emia means high levels of bilirubin in the blood. And this beautiful diagram, it's a little fuzzy, but I want to keep it large, talks about three ways an animal can exhibit hyperbilirubinemia and in only one of the cases is there liver dysfunction. So let's start here with A, panel A. 
Hemolytic anemia. Well, remember, lytic or lysis always means breakup. Hemo means blood, and we're really talking about the red blood cells. And anemia, look at, there's EMIA again. Huh, just like here. This means blood, and the A or AN in front of a term usually means without. So anemia literally means without blood, but we know it's usually low numbers of red blood cells, low hemoglobin. So for some reason, the red blood cells are being lysed, destroyed, faster than normal, and you would call that excess hemolysis. You know, it looks like hemolysis, but a lot of times it's pronounced hemolysis. Excess hemolysis. You know, that foal back there, there's a case where they can have excess hemolysis because of what the mom did to them. Amazing. Anyway, in this depiction then, this is the liver here. And we're just saying there's going to be too much bilirubin, too much bilirubin in the blood, and then we get it released into the bile, okay? So the point is normal liver function, and I think that's what that brown liver is depicting, which is, I just realized that now, normal liver function, but it's overwhelmed by too many red blood cells being destroyed. Let's go to the other normal case over here. The liver is dark, indicating it's a normal functioning liver. But look at now we got a stone in the bile duct. Bile cannot leave the liver normally. This is the small intestine here in every case, small intestine. And so the exocrine secretion we call bile can't leave. So it's going to be built up. It's going to spill over to the blood. And we're going to get hyperbilirubinemia excess bilirubin in the blood in the face of a normal liver okay now the abnormal case here is B in the middle and the pale liver must indicate then something wrong with the liver and in fact it's hepatitis which you know means inflammation ITIS of the liver it could be caused by many many things again but this is great. This shows you three ways to get hyperbilirubinemia, and only one of the cases has uh, a lower functioning of the liver than normal. Excellent, excellent diagram. Now again, um, you know, we focus a lot on terms and understanding how terms are put together and what they mean, because when you're first learning this stuff about biology of the companion animals, if you read some literature and you don't know what terms mean, mean then you don't really understand the whole article so especially when you get introduced to this stuff man you need to know some terms and so I in that light made a copy of this article at least the title at least and let me explain it it's a little thing about idiopathic I'm up here now idiopathic hepatitis and cirrhosis in dogs and you can read this I'm not going to read it I'm just going to say Hey, whenever you see the term idiopathic, that means of unknown origin. Idiopathic, unknown, maybe arising from within, but we don't know why it's there. So when something can't be an exact cause found, a lot of times it's called idiopathic. And that's a term used many places. Now it's in front of hepatitis. So inflammation of the liver, but we not, we're not sure what it is coming from. But make sure you read down here too. Cirrhosis, that's where the liver has been damaged and normal uh, cell structure is kind of messed up and replaced by a lot of fiber and it makes the liver very much less functional and kind of rigid. And finally, usually as a courtesy, I try to show you where some of these um illustrations come from and i'm just gonna enlarge that a little bit and uh see you later